Welcome to Mommy Space, the podcast for moms of all stages. My name is Aubrey Coots, and this podcast was created to give moms a voice to share their experiences and to share that there's not just one way to be a mom. This is a place where you can learn to love the woman inside the mother. Welcome back to Mommy Space. This is Aubrey Coots, and today I am talking to my friend Linnea Hager, and we met um, several years back now through our church in San Bernardino and um, since then have stayed friends and have walked through becoming um, mamas together through adoption and she's just still a really sweet friend and I wanted to chat with her about um, what it has been like to have her child in a public school as well as um, what it's been like for her to be an educator in the public school system. Um, so Linnea, thanks for being on Mommy Space. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited and a little nervous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it'll be great. <laughs> um, I'm looking forward to hearing from you. So for those that don't uh, know you, can you tell us a little about yourself, your family, and the story of your journey into motherhood? Sure. Um, my name is Linnea, like Aubrey said. Um, I'm most likely described as an extrovert. I'm pretty loud. I love to be social. Um, pretty unorganized, kind of messy in my life. Um, I've been married for seven years to Josh. We're complete opposites where he is an introvert and very quiet. He's a dreamer. He has all these goals and visions and it's just the opposite of me and it works pretty well so far. So I'm pretty positive it's going to work out here. <laughs> <laughs> um, a little bit about me in the education world. I've been teaching for about 12 years now. Um, most of it has been upper elementary, five, six, seven. Um, sixth grade has been my all-time favorite. And I've spent the most time teaching sixth grade, and you truthfully couldn't pay me any amount of money to teach anybody younger. Like, this is where it's at. I'm not teaching yeah. anything else. Um, that's just kind of who I am. It kind of defines me, a wife, a teacher, and then a mom. Um, our journey, or my journey, I guess, to motherhood is a little bit different than the norm. Um, Josh and I got married when we were pretty old. In some sense, we were both almost 30 by the time we actually got married. We dated forever. <laughs> and truthfully, we weren't really even sure about having biological kids. Um, we got married later in life, and we loved spending time together, and we loved traveling. We loved all the extra time and energy and money that we had to kind of do what we wanted. Um, and so we both went into it knowing that maybe we'd have kids biologically, and maybe we'd choose not to. We were just kind of open to the idea. Um, Josh is adopted, and I always felt called to adopt. And so we thought, well, maybe someday that might be part of our story, um, but really didn't put a whole lot of thought to it. Um, we'd been married about a year, and we started having conversations with each other, like, you know, what if God has biological children in our story? Like, what if that's part of what he's writing for us? Should we, you know, be obedient to that? And so we just kind of went back and forth and decided about a year in that, like, we'd kind of just see what God had in store. And so we decided to let him be in charge of that. And um, honestly, after just one month of trying, we found ourselves pregnant. Um, and then we actually miscarried. That was probably the darkest and hardest time of our lives. Yeah. Um, and honestly, there aren't any words to even talk about what that's like. Being on this side of the journey, I can find the peace and the comfort and the beauty in that part of our story. But at the time, it was just rough. Mm -hmm. truthfully um and so we really just took a lot of time to just sit in that and just grow with each other and and just really process what had happened um as time went on we would learn that I have what they just generically say is unexplained infertility there's no real rhyme or reason to it and the doctors asked if I wanted to pursue finding some answers and this is where it's not necessarily your typical answer you get I honestly chose not to. Um, I didn't need to know the reasons. I didn't know, need to know the why. So I made the decision with incredible support from Josh to not pursue any type of medical testing or treatments or lab work or anything like that. I just, God didn't have this written for us and we were both okay with that. Yeah. And so we just sat in that place of peace for a long time and we just thought, you know what? We let God be in charge. And that was just not the journey he had for us. And we were cool. We're just living our happy little life. Yeah. Um, 
And honestly, we didn't really think much about it after that happened. You know, it just never happened again. So I thought that was God answering that, that, that calling, I guess. Um, then a few years go by and we start talking again and start looking into the idea of, well, there are other ways that we can be parents. It doesn't have to be biological. So Josh's mom worked for Olive Crest, um, a foster agency in Riverside at the time. And so we learned a little bit about it. He grew up with it. And so after she retired, we decided to just really jump into it. So we started doing some research and we took our first class with Olive Crest about three years ago. Um, and then about a year after our first class, we got our first placement, which was almost two years ago now. Um, and we had a sweet, wild little four and a half year old boy move into our house. <laughs> and we became a forever family in April of this last year, just right before he turned yeah. six. Um, and we have now done all of our recertification and are actually going to continue our journey as parents um, in the next few months with opening up our home to some of the fostering and some adopting and things like that, if God has that in his plan. Wow. Yeah. That's super cool. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah all of that backstory and just kind of what that process has looked like for you and Josh and even with your miscarriage, like sharing about that um, just to get to where you are today. And that's super exciting just to hear that you guys want to continue, you know, yeah, growing your family. It feels crazy right now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know a few people have asked us, you know, the same thing. They're like, are you going to do it again? I'm like, uh, I mean, probably, but right now I'm like, I can't imagine. Um, but- and we did. We took a lot of months. We took a lot of time after we finalized because you just want to process that this newness. Like this is our forever. We just kind of want to sit in our family for a little bit. Yeah. Um, and so it just has been within the last few months that we're like, okay, I think, I think we're crazy to add another wild one to the mix, but, <laughs> but we're open to it. So yeah, it's exciting, scary yeah. all at the same time. Yeah. Well, I'm very excited for you guys in that. That's super cool. And that'll be fun for your little guy to have a, <laughs> have some kids around too. It's fun. Yeah, we shall see. Yeah. <laughs> That's super cool. Okay, well, moving into our back-to-school theme, or actually I should say wrapping up our back-to-school theme with this episode, um, I'd love if you could start by um, answering, how did you and Josh decide what kind of schooling was best for your children? Well, when it came to school for our little kiddo, Um, There really wasn't a whole lot of conversation about it, just based on what our life is like. We're two working parents. Um, And so it kind of took out the homeschool option. And I don't want to homeschool my kids. It's not for me. Um, (laughs) It's not for everyone. That's okay. (laughs) Right. And um, I work at a public school and we've definitely got some luxuries with that. Like, I know that he could go to my school. I I can kind of handpick his teachers and his counselor and you know, I just, I have some say in that, um, which isn't a luxury everybody has. Right. But in knowing that, I felt a lot more comfortable with him coming to our, our public school. Yeah. Um, we don't live in the best area and our demographics aren't on paper the best for, for schools. Um, but I know that every school is different and I know my school and I felt super comfortable with him at my school. Yeah. Um, so it made the decision for public school really easy for him. Um, Growing up, I went to private school from kindergarten until I graduated college. Yeah. So I had no concept of public school, so I taught in one. Um, I did a homeschool program, but it was still through a private school. Um, So I really didn't know anything about the public school world, so I became a teacher. Yeah. Um, Josh was homeschooled until middle school, and then he went to public school from middle to through high school. Okay. um, In Yucaipa, so it was a very nice school setting for him. Yeah. Yeah. So it was just one of these things that I teach at a school. He can go to my school. He's going to go to public school. Um, And so it really was just the way it kind of was for our family. Um, And truthfully, I think there are positives and negatives to all types of schooling. Like I can find all the positives with him at public school and I can find you a million negatives. Um, So even though he's at a good school, there's still things I don't love. Right. But yeah. And he actually went to private school for about four months to a private preschool. Um, Just when he first moved in and before he was old enough to go to transitional kinder, um, we needed some childcare. 
And I honestly, real moment here, have worked in the state daycares in our district. Yeah. And I really didn't enjoy it. And I remember telling my mom, you know, 15 years ago, please don't ever let my kid go to school here. Mm-hmm. Um, and I just didn't love it. And it didn't sit well with me. So we did decide to take on the financial obligation of a private preschool. Yeah. It was quite a pretty penny, um, but we knew it was for a short time. And right. so we just kind of bit the bullet and did it. Yeah. Um, and he really did. It was the best place for him when he first moved that first transition of moving in to be in a small, loving, nurturing, good Christian, godly setting. Yeah. It's really good for him, I think. Yeah. I'm sure that that was helpful before, you know, before starting TK and having a bigger adjustment. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, yeah, that's good. Um, and another cool thing with, you know, the teacher perk of him being able to go to the school I'm at, um, I get to pick his teachers. <laughs> so I work with them That's all the time. Cool. Yeah. yeah. And I know I've been in their classrooms. I know whose personality is going to work best with him. And I know that's not the luxury everybody has right. or feels that they have, but you do. You, you can have that choice. All moms can go in and visit classrooms. And if you're not happy with how things are, be involved, ask questions. You know, you can get, you can get your kid what they need. Yeah. So always speak up, moms. Always speak yeah. up. Yeah. No, that's a great reminder. I think even right now, like, um, Nehemiah's the class that he's in. I'm like, I, I love his teacher. Like we're still thinking through, I mean, he's a kinder. So we're like, will we stay at this school? Will we stay public school? Like we're still working through some of those things right now. Um, but that's a great reminder of like, speak up Mm -hmm. on behalf of your kid for the things that you know that they need, things that you want for them, the things that you want to be a part of, even within the learning environment or, you know, yeah. school involvement or classroom involvement, things like that. Um, where I think, yeah, even, even in his class, I mean, his class is very small. Um, and I've seen just in the little bit of time in the school year that I feel like I'm the only parent that's involved. <laughs> and I'm like, man, it's like cool that we have the opportunity to be able to know what's going on and communicate with the teachers and you know, go to these school events and things that the the school puts on. Um, but yeah, in addition to that, like advocating for our kiddos well, yeah. for sure. You're definitely not the norm. I would love, I tell parents all the time, come sit, be a part of what we're doing, like be involved, like watch your kid in the learning. Like, and this year I've really shifted a lot of my mindset. And, you know, when I'm not connecting with the kid and we're having some trouble, my first question is to the parents, like, what can I do to help your kid? How can I best communicate? Hmm. But it's just hard in the public school sitting. It's, it's very hard to get parent involvement, especially at sixth grade. Like most of our parents are like, eh, no thanks. Yeah. So it is hard. So it is like my husband, Josh does go and sit in his classroom and watch him just, it's really opened our eyes to watch how he learns Yeah. to help us better work on things at home, how he learns in a classroom setting. And so, so it really is a good thing to go and do. And I wish more parents did go in and sit and just get to know your teacher, get to know your counselor, get to know, you know, the people on campus with your kids. Yeah. Even like Nehemiah takes the bus in the morning. That's so um, cute. But yeah, which, which is super convenient because <laughs> I have to take Isaiah to school like, you know, minutes later. And yeah. so it, it works out just logistically, but he was like the last stop coming home at the end of the day. And I was like, no, we're not going to do this. He's not going to be on the bus for an hour and a half. So I pick him up now. And even like last year, I didn't do that. So I felt like I never knew what was going on. I never saw his teacher. He just took the bus to and from school and I hated it. Where this year, even just like picking him up every day, like seeing his teacher for, you know, 10 seconds, right? Um, just checking in, like the office staff knows me when I walk in, like things like that. I'm like, it really is a different dynamic, even just being a little bit involved. Right. Um, so yeah, that's a great, exactly. great reminder. Yeah. And you know, we, our school runs another big perk is our school runs a program called the International Baccalaureate Program. This program that our school does is just amazing. And I wish more elementary schools like went through all this and did it, but um, the whole way the, the learning is focused on the student developing as a whole child, not just academically, but socially and emotionally. And it's teaching them these, these skills of uh, just becoming a lifelong learner. And everything's through inquiry and wonder and just really thinking through their learning. 
And for my kid personally, like even if this wasn't a school I taught at, I probably would advocate for him to be in this program yeah. because he's so curious. Um, he loves to just wonder and like question things and he just really soaks it all in. And so this really has been not just me because I work there, but for him educationally has been the best setting for him because it allows him to just blossom and he can ask questions and then they, they go off on the tangent of the question that the kids had and the kids really drive the learning yeah. in the classroom. Like my class, I plan stuff, but if I'm teaching about, you know, I don't even know, energy transfer. And then my kid starts talking about static electricity, which leads them then to start talking about lightning. And then they were wondering about this National Geographic movie they saw. Like we just let the learning go yeah. and I just teach along the way. Yeah. And it really has them take this ownership. So all of that together, like I work at the school, it makes it easy. Um, I can hand pick his teachers. Right. And then the program they run, all of those just made it not really even a conversation of where he'd go to school. For your family specifically, that is a really unique and awesome situation right, you're able to of say along the way. <laughs> um, when or at what point would you ever reconsider a different type of schooling option? He's only in first grade, so it feels funny to even talk about the conversations. When it comes to middle and high school, it stresses me a little bit. Yeah. I know that's a long way from now, but I've worked in our middle schools and I've been I've seen our high school students. Some of my kids are now those kids. Yeah. And it scares me, honestly, just based on where we live and just the type of things he'll encounter, which I know is out there in the world everywhere. Right. But when I'm teaching in it and I'm seeing it, it, it does. It scares me a little bit. So I don't know that I'm comfortable with him in a public middle school and high school for our city. Okay. Um, so homeschooling is not an option because I'm not doing it. <laughs> It's not what's for me at all. Yeah. And him and I's personality, like it would just, we would never get anything done. Yeah. Um, should we start looking at public or private schools now when it's still five years away? Should we start putting money away now? Cause we're no, we're going to take on that burden. And then honestly, sometimes the conversation is let's just move. Let's just live somewhere else <laughs> yeah. with better schools. <laughs> right. That's really what it boils down to occasionally. Yeah. That's how I usually end the conversation. Fine. Let's just move. I'm done. Yeah. But it's tough. It's hard. I totally get that. And I think like, yeah, even now I, well, I always anticipated that I would homeschool and now, you know, two of my, my two kids that are in school are both in public school. And I'm like, I don't know if that's what's best for them. I don't know. Like at what point do we reconsider? I know, like I went to private school my whole life and I feel academically I did probably better than what some of the public schools had to offer. Smaller class sizes. We had, you know, different curriculum, yeah. way better behavior because our parents were paying a lot of money for us to go there. Like right. I know there were some other perks to that. Um, but then I just look at my kid and just the services he gets and the opportunities he gets and the way he's being taught and just the different field trips he's on and things like that that come with the public school and the state funding and, and things like that, that I'm like, man, he really is getting a lot from this public school space. Yeah. Something that we've talked about in previous episodes for back, the back to school episodes is like even taking it a year at a time and being like, okay, this last year, how did that go? Is this something we want to continue in? Do we want to try something else? Not that you want to, you know, switch it up every year for, for the sake of it, but <laughs> Um, but being open to that and yeah. really letting your kid decide like what is really best for him, for our family, for our season of life, really letting that kind of guide your path. Yeah, definitely. All right. Well, my next question for you is what for you is most important about your child's education and learning experience? I want them to ask questions. I want them to search for their answers. I want them to be an open-minded learner that's aware of other people, other ways of life. Um, I want him to become a problem solver. I want him to fail and keep on trying to win and celebrate success. Um, I want him to be kind. I want him to be helpful to his classmates and his teacher and the other people on campus. Um, I want him to learn that he has an impact on the world, uh, both positively and negatively. Like, I just want him to be challenged at school, 
um, corrected when need be. Yeah. Doesn't know everything. Um, to be celebrated and to be held accountable. Like a hundred percent could care nothing about what grade he brings home, hmm. what test score he got, what his reading level is. Yes, I know my kid should read. My kid should know some basic math. And I honestly think those things come. Yeah. Even looking at my sixth graders, those things will come. Right. But more than anything, I want them to, to just have a desire to learn. Mm, that's really good. Yeah. So. Even just like thinking about Nehemiah. And I think right now I'm just like, oh my gosh, school's going to be so hard <laughs> all the way through, you know, like <laughs> where you're like, those things will come. These mm-hmm. other things are more important in right. developing his character and developing, like you said, like a love and desire for learning. Um, and learning happens not just in a classroom. Yeah. Um, and you'll learn the kind of learner that your kid is. Like, is my kid a hands-on tangent learner? Does my kid read a book and now retain all that knowledge? Does my kid need to watch something? Does he need to draw it? And, and you'll learn how your kid is going to process that knowledge and that, that learning he does and just support him along the way. Yeah. I'm curious on this next question because you're also a teacher. So how do you balance mom life and school involvement life? And also what does your typical day look like? Well, I don't balance it. (laughs) (laughs) Honestly, all cards on the table. We got a housekeeper this year and that was a game changer for us. Praise God. Um, amen. <laughs> like if I could figure out how she could move in with me, yeah. <laughs> like I would pay her any amount of money to yeah. just live here. Um, it really, that was hard for me. Um, I felt like it was a little bit of a prideful thing for me to have somebody come in and help when all, it's all the things I should be doing. Like it's mom and wife things. Those are my jobs. I should do them. Yeah. So it was a little hard for me to swallow, um, to ask for help. Um, but I was failing. I was not able to be the best teacher, the best mom and the best wife and the best friend and just the best human I could be. I was struggling in all the areas. Um, I honestly didn't feel like I did anything well last year. Everything was pretty average. Um, So we talked about it. We looked at our budget and decided to just make some cuts and just hire a housekeeper. And it has changed our world. Yeah. Just having a little bit of extra help, freeing up just a little bit of time has really helped create a balance in our home. Yeah. For all that home stuff. And as far as work, um, I was pretty involved in basically everything. Yeah. I volunteered for all the committees. I stayed late. Um, I helped with any event that was happening. I didn't have any commitments at home. Yeah. Um, Josh was still working. So if I spent another hour or two at work, it wasn't a big deal. Um, so I did a lot of things. Um, and I kind of liked it. Again, it's a little bit prideful, I think. I liked being involved. I like helping with a lot of things. It, it fulfills me to help others. Um, yeah. So this year was hard. I had to say no to a lot of things. Uh, and I felt a little bit of a, like a sadness in me. Like I had to give some of my committees away. And I really like doing the fundraising, but I just don't have the time. And yeah. it's hard for me to admit that I couldn't do it all. Mm. Um, and that was hard. No, that's, that's real. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I feel like I'm constantly struggling with that same thought. Like I want to say yes to all the things. Yeah. And I mean, I shared with you at the beginning I have to take the rest of October off (laughs) of podcasting because I don't want to burn out. And if I'm just trying to juggle all the plates, like something's going to fall. So, um, yeah, yeah, like having to say no, having to humble yourself in that way for sure is hard. Yeah, it is hard, but you have to take care of you because you're not gonna be able to take care of all the other things. Right. If you aren't in a, in a good space yourself, learning to say no and working smarter in the six hours I have at work. Yeah. Just had to use my time better, which has been hard for me, but it's been, it's been a balance. Yeah, definitely. And what does your typical day look like? Like tomorrow? What is tomorrow? Your day like? I wish it was vacation. Um, <laughs> uh, I have to, I've learned that I have to get up before everybody else or else the whole day is behind. Yeah. Um, so I'm that means that. <laughs> I'm up by six. If it's a non-gym day, a gym mm-hmm. day, I get up at five. But on a regular day, I get up at six because I need to be completely ready by seven. Okay. There's a chance the child's waking up at seven. I got to be up by seven. Yeah. Um, he typically doesn't get up till about 730. 
So okay. in the seven to seven thirty hour, it's lunches and breakfast and getting our backpacks and collecting all of our stuff for the day. Um, he's up at seven thirty, and we hit the ground running and do our best to be out the door by eight. Okay, I got to stop for my caffeine fix on the way to work. Um, I have to be at school by eight twenty five. That's my contracted time. Um, I do my best to get as much work I can done in that twenty minutes before the bell rings. Yeah. With a six year old in tow, I don't get much done. Yeah. <laughs> but I try again, trying to use as much of that time as I can. Um, school gets out at three thirty, we're home by four. Um, we come home and play and relax and decompress and we don't do any homework because I'm not a big believer in homework. <laughs> and it's not the hill I'm gonna die on. <laughs> like you don't do any homework at all? Uh uh-uh. uh. I, I will mention it, like, hey, do you wanna do your math page today? And he'll say, no, I say, all right. And then I don't push it. Yeah. They need to play. Yeah. And he just spent six and a half hours Gosh. doing school. Right. <laughs> I don't want to do it anymore. Yeah. And honestly, just looking at our day, my kid goes to bed relatively early between yeah. seven and seven 30. Yeah. So if we're not home at four, that gives me three hours to spend time as a family. Feed to dinner, like, get ready for make bed. dinner, get a bath. Like, yeah, it just, it falls very low on my priority list. So yeah. So yeah, so we don't really do homework. We eat dinner by six. My husband gets off at six, so dinner's ready at six and we eat. Um, and then he's usually in bed by 7.30. Yeah. So it kind of wraps up our day. I wish it wrapped up my day. At that point, I then have to go around and do all the picking up, cleaning, kitchen, switching the laundry, whatever that looks like, which I like to be in bed by nine. It never happens. It's usually 10. So yeah, that's just my typical day. That is a full routine day (laughs) every day five days a week (laughs) yeah man that's good though and yeah I think your piece on family time and no homework I'm all about that so I'm going to start thinking through uh, how we could maybe implement something like that for you being an educator how does that play a role in your view of education options I think my role as an educator plays a role in my view in education because I really don't just buy the public school stereotype. You can have a great public school in a terrible area. You can have a terrible school in a great area or any combination of those. Yeah. Um, Not every public school is the same. I feel like sometimes there's a little bit of like mom shaming from people about, Oh, your kids go to public school. Oh, you don't go to private. Like I I felt that before. And I'm just like, I no, they don't. (laughs) We're in a public school. Yeah. It's a great public school. I know it's not in a great area and we've been on the news too many times, but we're a good school, I promise. Um, so I hate that there's that, that stigma that comes with public schools yeah. um, because every school is different and you just, every school, every teacher, every counselor, every principal, and any combination of those are what makes your school great. I, in my own classroom and all my years of teaching, I've never done test prep. Um, I've never taught to the test. I've never used any type of like test prep curriculum, (laughs) contrary to what people believe that I should be doing. (laughs) Um, I'll teach my my kids some strategies to take tests and some test anxiety coping skills and they're stuff we use all the time. And I, and I tell them all the time, the people who write your tests are writing them hard and to trick you on purpose. (laughs) Right. They write them way harder than real life actually is. Yeah. (laughs) Um, I know more from the nine months that you spend with me about what you know, what you've learned, how you've grown as an educated, like a learner and right. as a human, yeah. then your super long and fairly useless standardized test will tell me. Mm. That's kind yeah. of where I sit in, it's not your typical educator role, but that's kind of where I sit with education and, and public schools. Yeah. Um, and I did want to say on the flip side though, when it comes to like the social emotional learning, Um, being a foster parent has changed my game as an educator. Mm. Um, I've done a lot of learning and classes and just research on approaching kids that come from trauma backgrounds, um, because that's my kid growing up and learning how to be the best mom for him that I can be. Um, and these things I'm learning has opened my eyes to the kids in my classroom. My classroom's filled with kids who are in the foster system or have been kids who are at risk, kids who are coming from trauma backgrounds on the daily. Yeah. Um, And this is the first year in all 12 years 
that I have approached them from a different way emotionally. And it has been a game changer for me. So when I talk about, I don't care about test scores, this has just really solidified that for me that like, I care more about you as a human right? than I care about what you can choose as your multiple choice answers. Yeah. Um, but just the approach I've made has been huge for me and just how I approach them as an educator. Yeah. No longer just, I'm the boss, do what I say. Here's the lesson, learn it. Now I want to know how you're feeling today. Yeah. You're in a good space today. Yeah. What can I do to help you? Hmm. So all that foster training has come in handy, not just at home, but also at school. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's a really good point. It's cool that like, I mean, on one hand, it's unfortunate that it took (laughs) becoming a foster parent (laughs) to, you know, like have that mindset shift, but it is really cool. But I'm glad it did. Yeah. Yeah. And like, I wish I would have known this stuff years ago. Yeah. But you know it now and getting to use that, you know, with your kids in your class now, like that's super cool. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. Also really cool. Another plug for the public school system here. Um, Because I feel like I just negated everything when I said I don't believe in homework and I have test scores. Um, (laughs) I do love my job. But our district, like, we're not in the greatest of areas. And we do end up in the news quite a bit for some not great things. Maybe two years ago, two, three years ago, um, a big push in our district from like the superintendent on down was becoming a district that's trauma informed and culturally relevant. Those Mm -hmm. are kind of the big catchwords. So over the last few years, there's been a lot of training that's come down to us as educators to approach our classrooms being culturally relevant to cultures outside of our own and to be trauma informed and approaching our kids who are from a trauma background. Mm -hmm. Um, I actually got to the opportunity. um, I'm one of the coaches for our school now. So I bring the trainings back to our our team. Um, But as a parent in the public school system, that has made me feel so good because I have teachers at my school that I know are doing these things that are going to benefit my kid personally. This is at a personal level um, and how he's handled and how he's approached and how he's just kind of fostered as a learner. um, I know that they're coming from a a trauma informed space. Yeah. And then the same thing works for me. And I tell my parents of my own classroom, like, here's where I'm coming from. Like I'm doing all this research Here's stuff I'm studying. Like I'm trying to come at your kids from a different space. And it really has been a really cool thing across our district. I see it on our campus a lot now, with just how other teachers are approaching some of our kind of more problem kids and our at-risk kids. Yeah. Um, rather, you're just a problem, they're a problem kid, like, oh, it's just rough, they're just difficult, coming at it from, well, here's what's going on in their home. Yeah. Here's what their day looked like yesterday. Let's come about this in a different way. So yeah. there, are, there are things like that that are coming through the public school system that can overtake my no homework and I hate test scores. <laughs> There's some yeah. trauma informed and culturally relevant conversations that are happening these days that are pretty awesome. That's super cool. That's like super encouraging to hear. And I know we're in different school districts, but I'd be encouraged to, you know, like hopefully like our school district yeah. taking on some of those things soon too. All right. So my next question for you is what's a piece of advice that you would give a mom who's thinking through different schooling options for her kiddos? Do what's best for you and your family and don't let anyone make you feel bad about it. Yeah. Um, Whether you homeschool or private school or charter or public, whichever one you choose doesn't make you a better or worse mom for it. Yeah. Um, Honestly, we're all just trying to do the best that we can with what we have. Like you do you, you know, what's best for your family and for your kids. And like you said, it's like, do your research, Mm -hmm. but like go with your gut feeling of like, okay, what, what is going to be the best option for this kid? And maybe that's not the same best option for your next kid. Yeah. And that's just the, that's just the go with the flow that you you'll have to do is, is figuring out what, cause that's all we want. All we want is what's best for our kids. Hmm. The last question that I want to ask is what is the legacy that you want to leave for your children? When I first read the question, I was like, oh my gosh, I'm leaving a legacy. And I felt like a ton of pressure. <laughs> like, yeah. oh my gosh, I'm gonna have to leave a legacy. Uh, so I did. I kind of sat there for a minute, like, oh gosh, that's like a lot to think about. Like he's yeah. only six and I'm not that old and you know, things like that. But um 
and I didn't really know. I was like, I don't know. And I just kind of threw some ideas down and, and ultimately like, I want my kid to love Jesus. Mm -hmm. I want my kid to be kind. I want him to work hard, to love fiercely and just to be himself. Yeah. Like through my life, through our family, like that's what I want our family to do. Like to show him that we love Jesus. We're kind to people. We work our hardest. We love with all we have and we're just be who we are. Yeah. So man, I need, I need to apply this to my life. <laughs> you can leave that legacy for me too. <laughs> anybody, anybody wants to take it. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, that was great. It's hard to think of like, what do I want him ultimately as a grown up to look back and I say, it, yes, my kid did love Jesus. He was kind to others. Like how would I want to describe him as an adult? And now I just cross my fingers and pray that he does all these things. Yeah. Yeah. The rest, so, the rest is in the Lord's hands. Right. But. It's all you God. It's yeah. all you. <laughs> Yeah. Well, that's great. Well, thanks so much for chatting. And if you're a teacher listening, can you just be more like Linnea? (laughs) (laughs) Well, you wouldn't want to do that. Not all the time. (laughs) Yeah. But you've said, I mean, you've said a lot of really great things and and it's cool um, because I've had a friendship with you, but I feel like I haven't heard too much just about some of these perspectives and like your teacher point of view and, you know, the things that you value within Mm -hmm your kids education things yeah. like that so it's like cool to to hear all these things yeah thanks for having me thank you so much for listening be sure to check out all of the goodness from today's episode on the show notes and share this with a friend if it impacted you in any way you can also leave a review on itunes so other mamas can join in the movement of loving the woman inside the mother join our online mommy space community every day by following us on Instagram at mommy space. That's M O M M I space where you can interact with me, some of our past guests ask simple or hard questions and give your valuable input on how to make mommy space an even more beautiful, safe place for mamas all over the world. All my love to you, mama. You are enough.